Now, say my name. The Rolling Bad Podcast. You're goddamn right. Coming to you almost live from the Silver Tower, floating over Rio Rancho, New Mexico, like a balloon. It's the Rolling Bad Podcast, episode number 135. It is October 9th, the last day of the International Balloon Fiesta, and I'm your host, Bill. Hey, just like Kairos, I'm living in the past. Castello, and with me? All the way from the Lustrian Rainforest, it's Joshua. Yes, I invested in that Blood Bowl team alt. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) <laughs> i'm wondering if mine came in i don't know i i couldn't go yesterday uh mine mine came in like friday afternoon oh nice um and then i also bought the pitch the spike nice the cards and another box uh on top of the dice and the box that i bought damn <laughs> uh nothing like going all in yeah the amazon team really interests me yeah i uh they look so fun they're just like different from other things you know where people are like yeah you just Build up your blodgers, and then you run Griff Overwald, and then you're good to go. Yeah, I right. Know. <laughs> that's the game. Mm-hmm. We well, can't run Griff, and uh, yeah, the Amazons just look beautiful. I love an all-female team. Nice. Sorry, I have to edit out my drinking there. <clears throat> <laughs> I've been trying to do that my entire life. <laughs> I love it. Okay, in the wow, AOS is broken department. <laughs> um, kind of want to talk about the day one results about the U.S. Open in Chicago. It's kind of cool. For the AOS side, up in number one, you have Stormcast Eternals with Knight Excelsior. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Number two is, I believe, a tie. Well, actually, it could be a three-way tie, but Cities of Sigmar, Hallowheart. Number three, Disciples of Zinch. Uh, I don't know if this is pre-book or post-book, but... Who knows? Coming up in number four is Daughters of Cain, Kelbron. Uh, five is Seraphon, Cottle's Claw. So then following up, we have Lumineth, Iron Jaws, and I forgot what the other one was. I think it was another Stormcast. I'm not sure. Don't quote me. But uh, that was just the results at the end of day one. So <laughs> uh, nothing repeated, not even once. Pretty yeah, good. it doesn't seem like it. I mean, yeah. I like that part of it. It's just way too much order in there. Uh, which is good, which is good. Um, <clears throat> filthy chaos shouldn't be allowed to do anything. I'm just um, wondering where my destruction boys are at. Iron Jaws aren't even in the top eight. Uh, they're in the seventh. Are they in seventh? Yeah, so oh, okay, cool. maybe Mork. Yep. All right, well, they're yep, on the they're top four. So uh, I have to imagine that shortly after uh, this week's pre-orders, we'll start to see some Sons of Behemoth. <laughs> I am so excited. I, I haven't looked at it yet, but uh, they really needed an update just to bring them into the... 3.0 fold yeah the 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 little bit changes that they've been doing i don't think really address things that they really need yeah. to be able to do so yeah. i'm sure this book will yeah i'll probably look at a like russ's breakdown or something here yeah you know later today yep but the one thing that stood out for me for them is the i'm gonna pick up this monster and put it wherever i want <laughs> like <laughs> okay ah <laughs> uh, that's different yeah that's a that's a hell of a rampage Oh, man, I was only able to charge one of my guys in. But, you know, two homies are right next to him. So, boop. All right, now you're next See to See ya. Them. Yeah. Oh, this sucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch how Behemoth develops. It's always scary when you see a faction like that that's just, we're talking beyond elite units. Yeah. These are like, you know, you're going to have three, four, six max units models on the table yeah so how you play those is critically important oh yeah and you know it's fun to see how some of the some of the really good behemoth players operate with those it's really a learning experience and i think honestly you could learn a lot about movement and positioning and how incredibly critical movement is to the game by just watching a bat rep with sons of behemoth in it oh 100 percent well the uh also that prayer that king broad has yeah um, it's, uh, giving everything like across the board, additional rend for their weapons. I was just like, what's happening? <laughs> Which is good because, you know, they, they could do damage, but they couldn't punch through sometimes. It's so maybe that little bit plus some of the other changes they make is going to help them actually like be in the fight instead of just stand there and take hits and then back up and stand and take hits. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of hoping they do give them. Cause you know, when you, when you're down to that few models in an army, it's, they have to be able to 
to punch. Yeah. They have to be able to get damage in. Otherwise, they don't have enough hit points to just last and last and last. We've seen repeatedly on bat wraps how they can be taken down in yep. a turn. So the right Stormcast army will just delete one giant per turn. Yeah, so yeah, they will. One Mega Gargant, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully the uh, they're repackaging the babies, baby giants, yeah, yeah. Uh, as threes now, it looks like. Yes. So, you know, that that was the best. I think that's really good because before, like, you'd get two. Yeah. And so you'd kind of be forced to buy three boxes in order to get, like, two full units. So it's pretty annoying. And even if the price point's the same, as long as they're packaged together, yeah. that'll make me happy. It, um, it makes it easier for someone to get into them. Exactly. If you don't have anything. Right. Because that, that army, I mean, it's probably an $800 investment for just the models. Yeah. Like to start. Like that's four bigs or like assuming, sorry, assuming that the package of three is going to be the same cost as a mega. Yeah. You know, three megas and three babies or four megas or whatever it is you're going to do. Yeah. But I think that they're really cheap to get into they're great models to paint i'm so excited we'll probably be covering their book on the next show actually uh yeah actually we have we have a plethora of books because you know coming up is lumineth yep. and sons of behemoth we'll do our our narrative breakdown of the books and let we'll let face hammer and, and vince over at warhammer weekly do the the meat yeah so we'll do the fluff <laughs> <laughs> although well, we are going to cover obviously in today's show we're going to cover the uh, the Zinch battle tome, the with an emphasis on the path to glory stuff, but we do have to cover a little bit about how the army works so that the yeah uh, path to glory makes sense to you. Exactly. But we're also going to talk about the the drop this week of the two Meta Watch or last week and this week the Meta Watch articles slash videos where GW talks about how they balance things. And we're going to give our take on the overall balance of the game as it stands right now. So mm -hmm. that's what the show is going to be. Um, Want to hit real quick. Uh, we are going to cover the yesterday's video of the 35th anniversary Warhammer 40K yep. extravaganza. Uh, in the main show, we're just going to basically tell you what's coming out and what our thoughts are. Stay tuned to After Dark for the oh my god moments right. that we're going to have because those dogs are tight. Yes, yes. It was a spicy reveal for anyone who knows the Kadia stands. <laughs> Did you watch the video? Yeah. I love it when Adam was like, you notice none of them are kneeling? No, because Kadia stands. <laughs> I thought that was just too comical, but all right. Love it. Love it. So, in fact, let's just jump into New Dawn, and we will start with the 35-year anniversary show. Hard to believe, honestly, because I can remember as a wee lad buying RTB-01, the original Space Marines. Oh, wow. Rogue Trader. And, uh, yeah, it was when they started showing that box, I was like, oh, my God, I still have those three rule books right there on the shelf. From second edition. It's like, and I have my signed Jason Priestley Rogue Trader books. So, yeah, it was kind of a nostalgic little throwback. 35 years of 40K. And I'd say 80% of it, it's a unbalanced, worthless game. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. So, the anniversary show was 40K. There's no AOS release in there except for the one. Yeah. That is more AOS than it is 40K, but okay. Hey oh Yeah, so the big thing was the Cadia Stands box. We knew it was coming. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. to actually just see it, so you got new, um, you have a new Cadian Shock Troop squad of five, yep. which can be either Cadian Troops or Cadian Shock Troops. Very, very nice. You have oh, three new artillery kits. Love it. A Sentinel kit that they're probably going to get sued for, which would be awesome if they got sued for that kit instead of them doing the suing that would be so cool i don't want to see it but I'll i mean that sentinel isn't so different from what it was before it really isn't and i believe that the existing structure would would save them but yeah. i would still love to see disney go after them for nope that's an atrt sorry <laughs> and honestly 77 for star wars and uh yeah okay anyway uh, of course, the new Commissar model. Oh, yeah. Holy. And grenade. Anyway, that looks like a phenomenal box. Uh, I will have several. Oh, yeah. 
And I think, sorry to jump ahead to this, but no, this please. sort of tags directly to it because Kill Team Shadow Vaults was also released. Yep. yep. Uh, more uh, shat- uh, Space Hulk terrain. Oh. And we get the Kazarkin. The Kazarkin. Oh. oh. Good um, Lord. So stoked. Um, they're bringing in new things to the kill zone, sentry turrets, equipment stashes, ancient yep. robots, new missions. Of course, it also is a more terrain for Space Hulk related stuff, boarding action stuff, which, by the way, yeah, boarding actions are now going to be a thing in 40K. This is tagged to the um, Arcs, Arcs of, of Omen. Omen. A narrative. narrative system. And they made no bounds about no. <clears throat> they made no bones about it. This is a narrative system for 40K, even going so far as saying we're not going to be releasing all of this. We're going to release all of this in a book yep. so that you'll be able to do all of this amazing stuff. And then as these kits come out, because with the boarding actions terrain set, it looks like uh, I think he said it was twice what you got in the kill team yep. box. So you add the original kill team box, that box, and then the uh, kill team shadow vault, which are all the same terrain pieces. Yeah. Um, you're going to fill a table with, you're going to play Space Hulk with 40K armies, which is what their whole thing is. That yep. boarding action is 500 points, no monsters, no vehicles. It's basically take your combat patrol and have at it. And we were talking about it just before the show. It's going to be bonkers. Yeah, like you're saying, Terminators are going to feel like Terminators again. Yeah. You know? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be insane to see them actually walking down the hallway and like Las Gunfire just not doing anything yeah. to them. And, you know, you know or, they're going to walk down two by two, two by two, whereas the guard is going to be coming up four by four. And it's going to be a reasonably fair fight. Uh, except for the guard's <laughs> going to die a lot. <laughs> and then having Castellan robots just walking down the hallways and just obliterating anything in front of them. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be great. I'm so excited for that. Mm -hmm. And I like how they specifically in Arcs of Omen said, we are not giving you new rules in these books because you guys complain about it, frankly. But um, this is just going to be moving the story forward. It's going to be the narrative and it's going to be boarding actions, right? And I'm hoping that the boarding actions are of sufficient quality that they actually start looping them into tournaments and things like that. Like having a, it's cool. You can have the kill team into the dark style tournament. Then you can have a boarding action style tournament. But the coolest thing is when you have a 40K and boarding actions narrative event. Yeah. Right. That also has kill team. Yeah. You know, like having all three of those looped together. And combining uh, into just this massive story. Oh, yeah. I can see how with this Arcs of Omen setup, even in a tournament setting, the guy that doesn't have, who's new and doesn't have 2,000 points painted up is going to be able to go and have meaningful games in a tournament setting, in a fun narrative tournament setting. Whereas also the guy that gets knocked out, you know, and we're seeing this more and more at the bigger conventions, that if you haven't gone through your pod, if you haven't gone through your group, you're not going to, you're not going to win. Yeah. You're, You're not, you're not in the bracket to go forward. Well, at that point, your 40K games are kind of, you're playing just to have fun. Yep. Well, now you have the option. You can stay with the 40K GT and, you know, play through those games. Or you can just say, hey, I'm going to scale back and I'm going to start playing, you know, boarding actions. Yeah. And have maybe just as much or more fun. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I've got some more ideas for that. So also that came out, uh, that was bo- the Avoid War bases. Um, once again, GW is doubling down on that whole yeah, resin bases are cool, but, you know, we can put these plastic bases out in greater numbers. Oh, um, so good. It looks so good. <laughs> depending on the price point, yeah, those could be hits. I have used the GW bases more than I probably should admit. <laughs> but, I mean, they're just so handy. They're already there. All you got to do is base coat. I mean, literally just the GW paint method, get those yeah. things ready, and you're, you've got a themed base set. It's awesome. Oh, it's great. I mean, if anyone plays Necromunda, you know. Oh, God, The Necromunda yeah. bases are absolutely fantastic. Being able to theme them up like this with Space Hulk stuff is going to be so great. Mm-hmm. So great. Yep. So, and then, of course, the mod, the one thing that came out of the big reveal was the World Eaters juggernaut. <laughs> I forget calling him what he is. They call him Lord Invocatus. Yep. Yeah, sure, whatever, juggernaut. He's the new juggy, but even in the pictures... 
they show that he can be built in two ways. Yep. In one way, he's very 40K with a bolter and a, and a power sword, and uh, the, the beast looks boxy and armored. Yep. And then the other way you build him, he is. <laughs> he's for it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It just flat out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that a Lord on Juggernaut? Yeah. Uh, could be. Yeah, yeah could probably be. is. Probably is. Looks great. I mean. Oh, it's a bonkers good looking movie. Movie. <laughs> Model. That's Invictus, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not in Bacadith. Right. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm all over it. <laughs> I really like that one soccer movie starring the Corn Lord. And... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Will that bend it like Beckham? No, I don't think so. <laughs> God. All right. Anyway, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> so that was basically the uh, the 40K anniversary show. I think a lot of people expected them to drop news about 10th edition. I think this is the... I think actually Arcs of Omen are the end times for 9th edition. I think this is how they're going to transition us over to 10th. Like how Vigilus worked out? Yeah. Except this one isn't going to be as... I mean, it, they're going to use it to move the story and do mm-hmm. stuff story-wise to set up 10th edition. And, you know, great. More power to them. And I think anyone who's participating in the grand narrative here in New Mexico might want to take some keep notes. track of what's happening. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we'll have our little squeeing fanboy moments mm-hmm. over this stuff in After Dark. Yep. But uh, there was a lot of AOS Available for pre-order this week. Uh, yeah, it was pretty yeah. much the AOS show this it, week. Yeah, I am stoked. Um, the best thing I think that they released for AOS out of this was the 30K land rate. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> okay, I found that funny. Yeah, let's get the AOS stuff out of there real quick. Bayard's Revenge, the uh, anniversary fig. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Did you read that article about how the artist yep. took that pic, that iconic painting and said okay this is how i'm gonna sculpt it exactly and i mean he nailed that picture it's just so good i ordered that like immediately oh it's so beautiful and you get what three per account yep um absolutely i mean even if you're not a a 40k fan just the the look of it is just so dynamic right it's like definitely something just to paint you know because it looks so good you know i was i was looking at that and i'm thinking there's going to be like four or five of these in the Golden Demon next year. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I was like, no, you know, probably people are going to shy away from it simply because it's the anniversary model and they would rather do their own impression of it. Yeah, that's so, fair enough. Who knows? But I, I'm sure we'll see at least a few of those amazingly <laughs> well painted. Uh, and then in the non AOS, the 30K Land Raider Proteus, um, for me, that's a personal win because I don't have to use my cardboard box land raider proteus anymore that i built way back oh yeah i love that model that proteus is so cool looking yeah it looks absolutely fantastic it's i I like them you know cleaner smaller um than the big one because you know my thoughts on the big one everyone yeah um the spartan can okay so um lrl battle tome dice cards and the vanguard box all for pre-order. Yeah. Um, that's it, another one I need to look at because I haven't watched any of the previews because those would have come up yesterday. But um, LRL has been sometimes cancerous. Sometimes, oh. you know, it just it's gatekeeping because it's just so powerful and some other armies can't even touch him. It's insanely expensive to play. Yes. Um, well, to collect, I should say. Yeah. So I'm hoping that the updates kind of brought them down a bit. I understand having a, a blue deck wins kind of army but it was just too much yeah it's if they adjust the sentinels a little bit i i don't honestly think in in 3.0 i think they got toned down enough yeah that you just don't see them dominating and i think they're in a decent place but they needed the third edition treatment obviously before glimpse bite um (laughs) those things are a scourge on the table oh Um, yeah but um yeah I, I'm really looking forward to this book as much as I'm hating the idea of this book because uh-huh. I have more outdated Lumineth Realm Lords books than anything else, which is sad to say that an army that's a couple of years old has had more books than almost Stormcast. So whatever. New Lumineth Realm Lords. Huh. Uh. But then Sons of Behemod and King Broad and $210 worth of Oh my God, I'm here to beat your face. Yeah. (laughs) 
Excited about them. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Their dice were supposed to come out. I also didn't see them on the website. Um, this is where you get the Man Crusher mob box, yep. right? Yep. I am pretty excited because they're adding more Mega Gargans, not just King Broad. Right. The Man Crusher is hopefully going to do more. Again, you know, go watch the the Face Hammer and all that stuff to, yeah. to see what their thoughts are. Uh, we'll definitely, once we get the books next week and able to digest them, we'll, you know, tell you our thoughts. Mostly narrative based yeah you know we're we'll obviously like we always do the meat goes to vince and face hammer and we'll handle the rest yeah so but uh yeah it's it's a big big week for aos these are two big factions they're yeah. widely played i think sons behemoth were incredibly popular when they first came out mostly because of how powerful they were at the yeah. beginning and then they tapered down as they got hit more and more by the nerf bats and yep. then how third edition really functionally changed and then how you could almost say that that first battle pack actually was should have could have been called screw you sons of behemoth <laughs> you know everything you have is a monster and all i do is hunt monsters yep and plus i have ways to say you can't do your thing to me yeah so it was kind of a it was a hard time for sons of behemoth now with the new battle pack they're in a lot better place yeah but I think the new book will help them out a lot. And, you know, LRL, I just hope, I hope the Realm Lords get a little bit more cohesive across the board. Yeah. If those books are anything like the last few books, Zinch included, it's going to be awesome because the balance in the, the Zinch book is so good. Yeah. And if they give them that same treatment, we're in for a, it's going to be awesome. I agree. I agree. These are going to be awesome. Yeah. And also some socks, so. Yeah, if you, uh, sure thing, socks, because they, I don't know whether it's the designer or if it's <laughs> the company that makes them, but they're even on the website, they're like, socks by some named dude, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. So they're awful proud of those socks. So that's kind of it until we get the news at 11. You know, I, I can't really, there's not a whole heck of a lot of other things. The Hellbrick novel was... Uh, put up for pre-order and is now unavailable so yeah go figure uh, i still do not see the dice on the website for the sons of behemoth or has it gone to no i don't see them that is strange it might have been delayed shall we move on to creation sounds good to me okay i will start because i have very little uh, that is applicable to this environment i did build the daughters of cain warhammer underworlds okay morgaith's coven I want to try all my paint ideas on that. So I built it. I have to right. undercoat it today and use my day off tomorrow maybe to start that. We'll see. I finished. I'm up to about 90% on my Legion commission. Nice. So, yeah, I've got uh, two full boxes of Pike Syndicates, Pike Syndicate uh, squads that were done. Okay. 100% and sent out. Uh, so... I think the only thing I have left right now is a uh, unit of Mandos. And what else? There was one other. Oh, added Tauntauns at the very end for some odd reason. But yeah, sure, whatever. I'll go pick up some Tauntauns and build them and paint them. Pocket Tauntauns. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're going to be playing a double bounty list and you want Tauntauns? No. No, you don't. <laughs> Let me tell you. But, you know, you're paying for them, so paying through the nose buddy uh okay so that's literally all i did was yeah those two boxes and what do you got um so it was very much just a building a uh, couple weeks for me i built most of the into the dark terrain built the new corn underworld models that came out oh they're so beautiful oh man just just gorgeous and then i built and primed the uh amazon blood bowl team uh just one box so far i got the second box because i wasn't sure how i want you know to progress, get more, less line men, that kind yeah. of line women, sorry. Um, oh, if I'm going to get bash one into uh, Stella Vanu, um, the special star player, mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to take one of the uh, Daughters of Cain Melusai models I've got and convert it into Boa Constrictor. <laughs> okay, I can see it, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be pretty fun that way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's actually... Strangely enough, um, after like working through so much of that into the dark terrain, my forearms were just wrecked and I actually had to like wear like some wrist braces and stuff. Yeah. And like 
they got better and then I started working on models again and then my forearms started hurting again. So I've kind of just been like off and on with that, trying to recover. Yeah, I hear you. It can be uh, episodes like that, you know, yeah. where you do a lot of terrain like that and you're doing a lot of heavy dry brushing and what yeah. have you. It's I kind of like, you know, if you go back and you look at uh, Gorilla Ash when he did his uh, that first kill team box with his yeah. terrain, that super just... He basically uses the zenithal highlighting idea, but to be more of the, this is the final coat. <laughs> and yeah. then he just kind of does a dry brush and then picks out some highlighted sting things. Uh, that's a really nice system. Although I don't think it would work for the end of the dark stuff because that is yeah. so much. And depending on whether you want to go with metallics or yeah. just drab, I kind of go want to go with like a gray. If this is going to be a ship, I have it in my mind that it's an old Imperial ship, okay. just basically from the look of the terrain. It's certainly not Tyranid. So I, I just kind of going to want to go with this industrial gray and green, you know, zinc chromate sort of. Okay. The stuff that militaries around the world just do. It's a zinc chromate base so it doesn't rust. And then it's gray. Yeah. Or it's some standard color that they buy by the metric ton. Yeah. So. I was going to kind of go with a black undercoat and then... I guess just sort of like an overspray at just the right angles of like lead belcher, just so that way it catches, you know, some of the metallics dry brush a little heavier where I want it to be. Um, I'm going to wash up with some actual plague bearer stuff. So it more closely matches yeah. my um, Geller pox, Geller pox <laughs> which are fully painted <laughs> by Yay! the way. Um, uh, all, uh, what was it? How many did I paint? Well, 17, 17 models. Yeah. yeah. I uh, have a few bugs left, but with, the current league i can only take like four bugs i no. think so didn't want to go too far on that but um yeah just super simple super straightforward stuff for that but it is heavy dry brushing the hardest part for me is like the terrain plastic is always just that little bit thicker yes coarser yeah. you know and harder to work through and so i think i was just cranking and cranking and cranking yeah. so hard trying to get through it that i just you know whooped my own butt with it so but cool. I'm excited to get on the Amazon Blood Bowl team. I really like the paint scheme that Warhammer TV put up, so I will yeah. be using that, maybe with a slight augmentation. But sure. the skin tone was the most important thing for me. But yeah, yep. that was my that was my time. Nice. So we created a little. We did good. So under battle, um, I got a game in of we did the same game that we did before where we swapped sides, uh, Night Haunts versus Daughters. Yeah. Um, but we didn't switch sides this time. We actually played our own armies and um it wasn't a game. <laughs> it was, I, we don't really know what happened other than he made a couple of big mistakes in deployment, putting uh, snakes way too far forward. That'll do uh, it. Yeah. And then not having anything, honestly, that was worthwhile to protect Marathi. Ugh. I literally dropped Marathi at the bottom of two. And nice. Yeah. It was, it was everything went on schedule and, I wasn't even at the point to where I had to devote a lot to taking those wounds off of her. Yeah. Once Marathi went, it was a question of just eating the rest of the army bit by bit. Yeah. And it was just, oh, it was horrible. I, I actually felt bad. But like she said, you know, when you make, when you try something different, you have to learn from it and you have to play it through. Yes. To see if you yes. can recover from that mistake. Yep. And he was doing the noble valiant effort to recover my recovery comes in. I have to build another. <clears throat> I have to build another Mortark. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't know how it happened, but um, oh god, now I can't think of his name. Oh god, Manfred. Manfred. Uh, <laughs> it's like what? Um, Manfred got left out of the box, uh -huh. and so when I put everything back in the car, I put the box in the car. Blah 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 blah. Hey, you forgot Manfred. Okay, put Manfred in the seat next to the box and I didn't this was not like some sort of breakneck drive across four by four terrain or <laughs> or what have you but by the time I got home he was on the floor and he was beat to death it was almost like something hit it <laughs> so I don't know I, I have to build a new one I'm not going to spend any I didn't like the way he was painted anyway he was junk I actually put him in the trash so well now's the time to Renew and refresh. Yeah, and I wanted, you know, use, I built him back in, back in the early 2000s. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, he needs a redo. 
update. You can kit bash a little bit. Your painting's going to be better. Yeah, everything yeah. across the board is going to be nicer. And he never really fit with the Night Haunt because yeah. he was done like seven years before they came out. Yep. So anyhow, that was the game. It was uh, it was bad. Yeah. Nothing for me this week. Work's been insane. I was just oh boy. conscripted to do a homicide trial starting on Halloween. Oh, fuck. So trick or treat. Happy Yay. birthday to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's uh, it's gonna be hell. So don't expect too many battles out of me the next you know few weeks. So I might try and get some kill team in because yeah. uh, I really like the color pox and I want to play them. Yeah, there you go. So that does it for battle. All right. So we're gonna move into the lore section, which is where we're gonna talk about uh, Zinch as a whole, and then later on we're gonna get into the Meta Watch stuff. But to cover Zinch, we shall cover. A little bit about how Zinch works. Now, the book has not changed a ton of their stuff. Uh, really, they're, they get one very cool new army-wide special rule, which is Arcane Armies. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So in the first battle round, after everybody's received their starting command points, but before the start of the first turn, so this is pre-game, Yeah, pick one friendly Disciples of Zinch wizard on the battlefield, that wizard can automatically cast a spell that they know that summons a burning sigil of Zinch, a tome of eyes, or a demonic simulacrum. So one of the Zinch specific endless spells. Correct. Uh, endless spells. You do not make a casting roll. That spell cannot be unbound and cannot be dispelled in the first battle round. Set that endless spell up as described in the effect for that spell. So boom. Free, endless spell to start the game. There you go. That's going to last a turn. Super themey rule. Yep. I mean, it's not it's not any endless spell, so it's not like, hey, I got my cogs, yay! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or here's my spell portal, and your deployment zone is deleted. No, it's not that. It, it's just one of their spells, some of which are pretty hot. So it's a very, very cool rule for I them agree. to have. I agree. So um, other than that, they're... Destiny dice remain pretty much the same. Roll nine dice, set them to the side. Different color dice. <laughs> um, one really nice change in this one is one of their uh, strategic objectives is this is like the auto that like daughters of can get. Everybody yeah. has pretty much an auto, but uh, there's this one basically says if you have destiny dice with a total of nine or more at the end of the game. You, you get your strategic objective. So if you also look through the army, if you have Kairos Kyra, Fate Weaver, he's going to bring you a die every turn. You have other methods of bringing back dice. Yep. It's a gimme. So Yeah, they made that one pretty easy for Zinch. They yeah, really did. I, if you are on the back foot, however, if you are having to use your destiny dice a lot, it could, I mean, I don't want to say it's a absolute gimme. If Kairos yeah. dies, eh, that those free dice are harder to come by. Yeah. So uh, Locus of Change hasn't really changed all that much. It's still minus one from hit rolls. Uh, wholly within 12 inches of a Disciples of Zinch demon hero. Yep. So, okay, cool. The Change Covens. Uh, I'm not going to get into them because that's the flavor of the army that you want to play. Um, each one of them is themey. They each have their little plus. Some of them are better than others. Some of them are, yeah, why? Yeah. Others are like, oh, oh, <laughs> okay. So summoning has not changed. Summoning is still really, really dependent on who you're fighting um, because you get a fate point for every successfully cast spell that is not unbound Yep. by either side. Yep. So when you're going up against Nagash, when you're going up against Croak, um, you're going to summon a lot of stuff. Yeah. When you go up against Fire Slayers, you're not going to summon so much. Well... I mean, generally your spells are going to go unanswered. Sure. I think they can unbind like maybe one or two, but yeah. And but, I mean, you're going to get a bunch of your own spells off, but I mean, the, the, the least cost unit is three screamers, which is 10, yeah. or 10 brimstones, which is 10. Oh, screamers or are good though. Blue horrors 10. So yeah, I mean, you're going to need, that's going to be a couple of turns, even yeah. if you're bringing three, four casters. So yeah, the amount of casting in this book, I mean, you know, they're one of the spell doms, so you're going to, it's, it should be expected. Um, and most of their stuff is like, hey, do you want to cast better? Well, here's this Warlord trait. Here's this artifact, yep. right? More and more and more spells, which I really, I thought I wouldn't like it, but looking through the book, I do. Yeah. I think 
the concern was, you know, remember, was it like 1.0 Zinch, like oops, all sky fires and, you know, just making people's lives hell. Well, yeah, the 1.0 Zinch was, oh, this is our super magic army, except nobody took them for magic because if you just loaded up with 27 sky fires, you won every game. Yeah. You could not lose. Um, well, you could if you were dumb. If you but, were fighting 28 Skyfires, right? Now. Yeah, but yeah, basically, <laughs> the mirror match was the only thing that really killed you. And then, you know, so there was like, oh, this is magic heavy? Uh, how? Okay, sure. Now it's really magic heavy, but it's not like oppressive by my read of it. It's strong. Yes. It and has decent internal balance. They are going to stand up to all those other magic, the, the techless lrls the yep. the techless led cities lrl across the board yeah the croak is gonna have a field day with these guys and what i like about the way they did uh-huh. this book is they didn't take away enemy spell casting they just made it a decision your opponent has to make as to whether or not they want to feed your machine yeah and i mean there's not a lot of things in here that say oh x plus x to unbind or you get to do this, or you get to auto unbind, and you know what have you. There's yeah. not a whole not the hell of a lot thing. of that. The techless thing annoys the crap out of me. Yeah. So, but in this one, every time you cast a spell against Zinch, you're feeding his summoning. You're feeding his ability. The chaos spawn that if you, if any wizard within nine of a chaos spawn successfully casts a spell the thing heals to full wounds and it's got oh, five wounds so good yeah so I, 85 points for one yes right those and plus you think about uh this is why i think the uh magister on disc is so important yeah because he has the bolt of change so if you kill a one wound two wound model yes oops here's a fine move chaos spawn in your midst and it's going to keep healing every single time someone casts within nine yes love it Love it. And they very specifically call out how that transformation works. So just so you know, if one of your units gets transmuted into a bad guy, Chaos Spawn, it does not count as a model that's slain for battle shock purposes. However, also, you cannot bring that model back. So if you had a unit of 10 and one of them got changed, it's now a unit of 9. Yeah. So you can't bring back that 10th guy because, well, exactly, it's a spawn. Exactly, exactly. So, and they spelled it out very nicely, very easily. So, really, I think a super well-balanced book. This is the most balanced I've ever seen Zinch. Yeah. To the point to where it's like, oh, I could kind of think about playing these guys now because that looks like fun. Whereas before, I've always been like, no, I don't want any part of that army. Um, Kairos Fate Weaver got really, really good. Not only does he add a Destiny die each turn, um, which really feeds your grand strategy but his basic abilities are now very intrinsic to how the unit the army works yeah but the flip side of that is this book is going along that current theme that we're seeing where units are not wholly dependent on auras to survive most of these units can operate independently and be expected to earn their points correct you know it's not like you have to, if you're not in the bubble, if you're not in the aura, you're dead. Yeah. So I like that, that it gives you the option to, you know, play your army the way you would like to play it rather than, oh, no, this is what we think it should be. Oh, yeah. So now let's move into the Path to Glory stuff. That's basically yes, how the army works. If you want the breakdown of the units and how Kairos got good and how the Lord of Change and the Gaunt Summoner, how they all are good and work together... Go to Vince, go to Face, uh, yeah, Face Hammer. So they will tell you all about it. We will tell you about the Path to Glory. Yeah, I like the Path to Glory here. So major theme, and this is just seems to be across the board for demon armies now, is that actual like demonic units are not part of your army. So your army is primarily, well, we should say the smaller demons. You can take like yeah. your Kairos, you can yeah. take your Lord of Change, your heroes. But, like, the standard non-hero demons are things that are summoned in. And the amount of them that you get in a game is dependent on the heroes that you have in your army. So, Lord of Change and Kairos bring three demon units. I think it's a standard hero brings two, right? Yeah, Gaunt Summoner brings two. Gaunt Summoner brings two, and then the standard Arcanite heroes and other smaller ones bring one. Bring one, yeah. And so, 
It's and you all, don't, they don't have to be rostered. They yeah. just you add them based on who you bring into the game. Yeah, and the thing is, they're going to be throwaway units because that you never take casualties on them because right. they just show up when you yeah. show up. Uh, and I, based on how I read it, is that like it just changes every single time. Yeah, right. Like you could be like, all right, I'm going to be you know three pink horrors. That's annoying. You're a jerk. Don't do that again. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll bring a flamer, screamers, and one pink horror. You're a jerk. Right? Don't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the flamers they don't have any native rend right now so right they but, rely on other people yeah but which is okay um yeah. and i love that i think the flamers are probably one of my favorite models in, yeah in, in zine should love them so this is something where you can really kind of mix and match the things but there's some stuff we're going to get to here pretty soon about you know who your heroes could end up becoming right yeah. or what heroes you can change to your ways that are going to be pretty fun but I like this element because it's not you're not so mired in do I upgrade my pink horrors? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you're actually getting use out of your Zengors and your Kyric acolytes, yes. you know, that oh, you may have incidentally or purposefully bought over the course of collecting Zinch. And particularly with the new box that came out, like that's actually really good for Path to Glory. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. I really like that box for Path to Glory. You know, maybe not necessarily for you might buy it once if you're trying to go on the competitive route. I like it for that. And that's that's a really big part of it. This is really cool. Uh, you'll talk more about this when we get to the actual battle plans. But there's actually like aerial battle scenario stuff. Oh yeah. In their custom uh, battle plans, they have aerial battles. This is gonna be awesome. I can't wait to see the interactions with them in like Caradron or um, yeah. fighting some Sylvaneth with their bugs. Like it's it's gonna be cool. It's We're gonna, be cool. gonna have a real talk about that one because it's at once brilliant and at once oh. Christ, really? <laughs> One other thing, um, just so you understand, at the very top of the Path to Glory, their army-wide special rule for Path to Glory is their initial wizard limit is three, not one. Yes. Otherwise, you pretty much have a non-game. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I can't take any demons. Super bonus right off the get-go. We're going to talk about the aerial battle rules uh, actually, let's get into them right now because yeah. that yeah, let's do kind of forms the basis for why you might want to do the quest that are built into Zinch or why you might not. Yeah, yeah. Um, so aerial battles, basically what they're getting at is these are fights that are happening above the plane. Yep. So uh, they are the aerial battle rules are used in the two scenarios that come with the book. Um but they can also be used for you know any scenario that you want to throw together as a exactly. as a rule. But uh, the first rule is breakneck speed, which is you will roll two d six instead of a d six when making a run roll for a unit that can fly. There you go. So everybody is darting in and out of the combat. It's super <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's those games are going to be wild. Yeah, they're just. Make sure you have a lot of room around the table because you're going to be everywhere. <laughs> Aeronautica Sigmoralis. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> so also units that can fly can retreat and still charge later in the same turn. Yep. They have a pile-in move of six inches and are eligible to fight when they are within six inches of an enemy unit instead of three. Boy, howdy. Okay. Uh, wow. What, what, what? Okay. I can see a Stormcast list brewing here. <laughs> I got to say, you know, we're excited about boarding actions. We're going to be excited about aerial oh, combat. Aerial battle could yeah. be. I mean, this is such a niche, th niche thing, but it could be crazy fun. But it's narrative. It narrative. is. Oh, it's, it's so it's, cool. This I mean, I can see why they wouldn't get near match play with this oh, set no. of rules. Oh, my God. Because now you have the other two rules, which are a long way up, which is any model that is unable to fly and that is set up or finishes a move wholly on open ground, not within three inches of a terrain feature, is slain. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's an aerial battle. If you're not on terrain that is, you know, obviously sticking up through the clouds, you're dead. You're yeah. just flat out go. Bye. Yeah. So, fire slayers, good night. Yeah. You're going to be either packed around the terrain or and basically unable to do anything unless you can reach <laughs> another piece. Has anyone seen the Doom Seeker? <laughs> uh -uh. It's a dwarf-shaped hole in the cloud. Yeah, I heard a noise like, ah! But anyway, <laughs> moving on. And then, of course, they have the long way down. So long way up, long way down. 
At the end of any phase, roll one die for each unit that cannot fly and that suffered any wounds or mortal wounds in that phase and or for which any successful save rolls or ward rolls were made in that phase. So even if you win, you lose. Um, on a one, that model is slain. Ugh. So basically, you fell, you fall off ledges a yeah. lot. It's the war cry, war cry ledges rule. Yep, brought over to Sigmar. <laughs> <laughs> AOS three point edition. So if you don't fly, don't play that yeah. scenario. Literally, don't do it. So the way you get to that is the two quests that the uh, Zinch have. Uh, the first quest, I'll do the first one. You can do the second one. Okay. Uh, the first one is gather ritual resources. And this one is at the end. Well, it's by carrying out a magnumantic ritual. It is possible to empower the crystal matrix that lies at the heart of this floating island. Doing so creates a vortex of energy around the island, allowing it to dominate the lands below it over a great area. However, before the ritual can be performed, it will be necessary to gather resources from locations that are held by your enemies. So at the end of each Path to Glory battle, add one quest point to the progress section of your quest log for each objective in enemy territory that you control. Okay. okay. So there's there's no buy-in to this one. You can't spend yeah. a point to buy a point for this one. So you have to take some victory. You have to take some locations. You have to play the game. Yeah, yeah. You actually have to... <laughs> And be reasonably successful. Yeah. So once you've gained three or more quest points, you can fight Path to Glory battles using the Magnumantic Ritual Battle Plan. If you win a minor or major victory in the battle plan, you complete this quest. The rewards are discussed in the quest. So, and the rewards are, if you win, you can upgrade a floating island to a soaring fortress. Um, when we get to the terrain... We'll explain why that's all oh, the territories, really the territories, but I can't big. Yeah, I know you want to do those. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do the next quest? Yeah, yeah, I'll read the next quest. So keep in mind, these are both now, these are both aerial battles, and you have to have your opponent buy into playing them. Correct. Obviously, if you're up against that Fire Slayer guy, he's not going to do this with you. However, if you're up against the Stormcast guy with the Dragon List, yeah. And it'd be pretty cool, too. Oh, God. Beautiful. All right, this one is Quest Rewards of Glory. Zinch champions who have proven their ability to dominate the mortal realms are able to summon Zinch's finest demonic warriors. At the end of each Path to Glory battle, if you want a major victory, you complete this quest. When you complete this quest, in the next battle you fight against another Path to Glory army, before deployment, you can give each friendly Horrors of Zinch, Flamers of Zinch, or Screamers of Zinch unit one veteran ability that can only be used in that battle. Yeah, that's pretty hot. Yeah, and that's definitely one of those ones if you have no other quests that you're really trying to progress forward. Yeah. This is just a solid one because you're going to get a buff in the next game if you win the major. That's right. right. Yeah. Um, so and it's worth the it's worth the try. You want to go ahead over the veteran abilities? Yeah, yeah. So what are you buying? What are you getting with this? Well, well let me tell you what. <laughs> Miasma of instability. The very bodies of these veteran warriors have been imbued with magical energy of Zinch. You. This unit can use its veteran ability once per battle in your hero phase. Until your next hero phase, this unit counts as being wholly within 12 inches of a friendly demonic, or sorry, Disciples of Zinch demonic hero for the purposes of the Locus of Change rule. Bingo. So, yeah, I'm on the other side of the board. And I'm about to get shot. Real quick, pop. This is great. I'm not going to be, you know, I'll have my uh, minus one to hit on me. Yep. Fantastic. And then you have Arcane Fusillade. Harnessing their collective magical might, the Chanters of Change unleash it in the form of Searing Bolts. Kyric Acolyte units only. This unit can use the veteran ability once per battle when it's picked to shoot in a shooting phase. <laughs> Add one to hit and wound rolls for attacks made by this unit until the end of that phase. Ah, uh, poor Skyfires. <laughs> Pretty spicy. It's on your Kyrix. All right, I yeah. get it. But... Just having that like once per battle, just an extra of when you're shooting is it not could terrible. Be nice. I would I would like to see that if they applied that to the to the what's his names? <laughs> to the Skyfires, but Yeah, they don't. They do have one from the Skyfire Zone. We'll yeah. go ahead and talk about that in a minute. So Savagery Unleashed, favored by their god. These warriors unleash a flurry of attacks upon their foes. Zangor hosts only. This unit can use his veteran ability and once per battle and is picked to fight in a combat phase. If it has made a charge move in the same turn, hmm. add one to hit and wound rolls for attacks made by this unit until the end of that phase. Pretty spicy on a whole block of Zangors charging in. Hot, um, very hot. Yeah, I 
I think that's going to be one you take on any Zengor unit that you have. Sorry, foot yeah. Zengors. Ornate yeah. Zinchian Spears. These Zengor Enlightened wield ornate spears of quality beyond the weaponry of their lesser kin. Zengor Enlightened units only. This unit can use its veteran ability once per battle at the start of the combat phase. The strike first effect applies to this unit until the end of that phase. Oh, Ooh. God. Woo. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's spicy. Very. Um, Deadly Harmony. These experienced warriors have tamed their dis- discs of Zinch, giving them great speed and maneuverability. <laughs> Zengor enlightened on discs of Zinch units only. This unit can use its veteran ability once per battle at the start of the movement phase. Add nine inches to this unit's move characteristic until the end of that phase. <laughs> For the love of Christ, that's huge. <laughs> yeah, here's my uh, six Zengor enlightened on disc, and they move 25 inches. Yeah, and just think about... Uh... <laughs> I'm playing the quest, and I need to take three objectives in enemy territory. It's turn five, and all of a sudden I have a 25-inch move. Yeah. And you probably haven't guarded your stuff the way you should have. Yeah, that's huge. Mobility is insane. Death from on high. Zengor Skyfire soar across the battlefield, raining death upon the foe. Zengor Skyfire is units only. This unit can use its veteran ability once per battle when it runs. This unit can run and still shoot. In the same turn. Bonkers. Right? Oh, crap. They're getting too close to me. I'm going to peace out, but I'm going to shoot you in the face still. Exactly. So, <laughs> pretty decent veteran abilities, which, again, yes. you know, like, that's as you upgrade your stuff. But having the uh, the ability to give them a veteran ability, you know, just because you completed the quest beforehand yep. is pretty spicy. And you'll notice that you can use it on the horrors of Zinch, Flamers of Zinch, Screamers of Zinch, not the named ones. Right. So it only applies to the miasma of instability now that I'm actually thinking about it. But that's really good for being able to protect those, you know, little units um, in, oh, now it makes sense. There's the light bulb. Sorry, folks. Uh, since you can't give demons any of these veteran abilities, you have to do this. This so is the only get, way you can give yeah. them, yeah, because they don't exist from turn to turn. Yep. You know, or round around exactly so there you go well i feel like i read a lot and learned a lot about myself (laughs) Um, see folks we can all change for the better if we let ourselves that's right be the change you want to be in aos yeah (laughs) but the territories all Uh, right so the first one is everything i mean all of them are great yeah but the first one is where your narrative is going to take flight <laughs> in a significant way. 61 to 62, Arcanite Cult. Many of Sigmar cities have been infiltrated by Arcanite cults. Oh, God. These secretive clandestine organizations are hidden by illusion and deceit and can quickly gain control of a settlement if they are not discovered in time. You can take cities of Sigmar units as allied units for your army. In addition, in step seven of the aftermath sequence, roll a dice. On a five plus, you can reinforce one eligible Arcanite unit on your order of battle without having to spend any glory points. Oh, God. So, you heard it here. You can take Cities of Sigmar in Disciples of Zinch. Can anyone say Celestial Huracanum? <laughs> can you say, what was uh, uh, Flame Spire Phoenix? Yeah, Frostheart Phoenix. Frostheart, yeah. Do, do. I mean... There's so many crazy combinations <laughs> that you can bring in, but I think the Phoenix Guard, yeah. having a s- crazy stalwart unit, being able to just like camp objectives while your other stuff's running around and doing stuff. Yep. Just don't Woo. don't bring them when you're looking on a flying aerial battle <laughs> one. Don't don't. Well, do that. bring your Flame Heart Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> or your sorry, Flame Spire Frost Heart Phoenix. Yeah. But hey, let's talk about how you upgrade this one. It's five GP Ooh. unwitting puppet. When you pick an army, you can choose an allied Cities of Sigmar hero. As the general of your army. If you do so for the battle, they gain the Disciples of Zinch keyword and the Change Coven keyword for your army if it has one. Now, all of a sudden, you can start using Destiny Dice. <laughs> uh, at that point, you become scary as all hell. I absolutely love this because it's it's 100% narrative. Yeah, we it's were talking so about great. this before the show. That You could write an entire storyline just about this about a city state uh, that just fell to zinch in these increments and uh, it could be brilliant it could be yeah. the basis for a whole narrative campaign exactly throwing, throwing back to what we talked about last <laughs> week um but honestly that right there is a hook you can use in a game a narrative event yep just a city state that's falling to zinch and one side is trying to make it fall the other side is trying to go hey guys uh, everything is not what it seems. Yeah, and fight it out. 
Exactly. So, yeah, it's so, that's so rich. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. So I'd really say look to that to guide some story stuff. It's it's so amazing how two paragraphs so eloquently put could form an entire narrative storyline. Yeah. Like, that's the kind of stuff we're looking for when we're, we're, we're making narrative. Um, next one, Floating Island. This is the one we talked about earlier, yeah. um, the upgrade you can get. So the Floating Island is you add one to the number of territories you can control, and you can only upgrade this territory if you complete the gather ritual resources and win a minor victory or a major victory using the Magnomantic ritual battle plan. But you uh, can upgrade it for no money, no GP, no investment, folks, other than completing that you know battle plan, and you get add three to the number of territories you can control instead of one, and you receive one extra glory point in step one of the aftermath sequence. That's huge. Huge. It's and insane. Again, you need someone else to buy off on playing that those scenarios. Yeah. Obviously, you know, not every army is going to want to do an aerial battle. But when you find it and you get it set up correctly, it can be huge. Just huge. Next one is Summonation Site. <laughs> you can never have more than one territory of this type. Add one to the number of Zinch Demon units that are not heroes that you can include in your army. In addition, when you pick your army, you can give one friendly Horrors of Zinch, Flamers of Zinch, or Screamers of Zinch unit one veteran ability that can only be used in that battle. Okay. So, yeah, just, hey, here's an extra unit, and it gets a veteran ability every game. Nice. Um, beautiful. But you can upgrade it to Locus of Instability. Add three to the number of Zeech Demon Jesus. units that are not heroes <laughs> that you can include in your army instead of one. In addition, when you pick your army, you can give up to three friendly horrors, flamers, God. or screamers of Zinch a veteran ability. Can you say snowball? Yeah. Oh my God. That's an avalanche. 20 GP to upgrade though. So yeah. 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 I mean, it should cost that much. Yeah. That's a huge ability. <laughs> 65 gets you annex of the crystal labyrinth. You can never have more than one territory of this type. In each aftermath sequence, you can pick up to D3 different units to benefit from this territory. When making a recuperating role for a unit you picked, it is treated as not having taken part in the battle. Ooh. Instead of picking any units to benefit from this territory in step three of the aftermath sequence, roll three dice. For each five plus, you can give one unit on your order of battle that was not included in your army in that battle one renown point. So you get to do either the recoup or you get additional renown. So if you're like, oh man, I built up so much summoning that I just send waves of demons yeah. at my enemies and none of my actual models get hurt. So I'm just going to keep renowning them up, renowning yep. them up. Oh, I mean, you can't snowball. So if you're if you got a Zinch player in a path to glory, make sure that you you work out how that kink's going to be. Remember, we talked about that before. Yeah. Um, and number sixty six, the Silver Tower. Oh. You can never have more than one territory of this type. When you add this territory to your roster, you can add one Gaunt Summoner to your order of battle. If this territory is ever removed from your roster, you must remove the Gaunt Summoner from your order of battle. You receive D3 extra glory points in step one of the Aftermath sequence. Oh, cool. Instead of receiving that, though, you can roll 2D6. On a 2 to 8, nothing happens. On a 9+, plus, you can add D3 quest points to the progress section of a quest. Uh-oh. Right? <laughs> so there's your out to not having to play the scenario. <laughs> right. Um, but, again, it requires such a confluence of events that at that point it's probably okay because other people are doing their crazy stuff in the campaign as well. I think it's a super well-designed path to glory. Yep. Um, on the next page, they have how to name your disciples of Zinch. <laughs> right. Um, the actual scenarios, the Magnumantic ritual and the other one that's called the pursuit, they're not really that, they're not really that crazy of a scenario. Yeah. Other than the fact that the aerial rules are in effect. So cool. So if you don't fly, you're you're dead. Yeah. And you both sides, you have to understand that it's going to be your flying units, but your flying units are going to be so. Just imagine a stormcast, basically Drake. Yeah. And you know the uh, what's his name, the heavy flying armored dragon guys. I can't remember their names now. Star Drakes. Yeah, the Star Drakes. No, the the ones before that with the knights on top. God, I can't think of who they are. Like the concussors and all those? Yeah, well, no, they don't. Do they fly? No, they don't. Yeah, no, they don't fly, but the other ones do. The Yeah, you know, 
If you're a Stormcast, you know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> if you know, you know. We're just going to leave it at that. Yeah, you exactly. know? <laughs> I can't think of who they are. But, uh, yeah, between dragons and, and you know, Karzai the Sacred, and <laughs> it that would be a game for the ages. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just every time you run, it's 2D6, and you don't have to not worry about running because you can run and char. It's, that battle is going to be bonkers. Oh, yeah. It'd be super fun to watch a bat rep of a, a game of that. Or just play in one would be even better. The Caradron overlords where it's, you got to keep your guys in the boat. Yeah. The balloon dudes are floating around. Like it, it would be so cool. It'd but be so cool. <laughs> you can drop them off on the objective, but you've just got to hope they don't get hit by anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, it's just crazy. Because it's a long way down. down. <laughs> so all in all, like, you said, you know, sort of like the Daughters of Cain, Path to Glory. It's not so expansive or rich, you know. Of course, nothing's so far. I don't think anything will touch. The Fire Slayer's uh, Path to Glory set up. That thing is just the coolest. Um, but what this does, and we talked about the elegance that you have in that first territory and what it can mean for an entire narrative game, right? Where you're like, I'm a... Like if you're the Zinch player and you're just trying to get to the point where you can upgrade yeah. that um, that territory so you can get the hero, which progresses the narrative, you know, and like it just sounds so amazing. Like a trying to stop a Zinchian incursion in one part of one of the mortal realms. Yeah, this is another one of those books where this this path to glory could form the basis of your campaign. Yep. You know, it could be the reason you're going, you have one or two Zinch players. And as long as those guys are, you know, experienced and they know how to drive the army, you let them have at this and everybody else that's playing, you let them know, Hey, you know, this is what we're up against. This is what you're fighting. Yeah. And it could become the focus and you can bring destruction units into it. Yeah. You can bring, you know, a whole bunch of iron jaws who just happen to be in the area and they throw in with the good guys because Zinch are ugly yeah. or, you know, they have too many eyes or something, whatever, you know, it's <laughs> whatever, however you want to hook them in. But yeah. it's, this is perfect for order versus Zinch. Yep. Um, because the Stormcast are going to do this. The Lumineth are going to want to kill these guys. And those are going to be good, solid games. Yeah. And, you know, when you do come to that, that quest where you need to play the aerial battle, you make some allowances. You say, Hey, you know, you can swap out all your annihilators for a unit of storm drakes. Yeah. And just for this fight only. And they don't get anything, but yeah. at least you're in the game. And I mean, you can do all kinds, so much stuff you can do. These aerial battle rules are really so cool, so well done. But the big drawback is you're going to have to find somebody that will agree to play you. Yeah. And it has to be mutually agreed on because that is just too strong. Yep. It's our, I mean, it's too limiting to what you're going to do. So with that, I think we will wrap up the Zinch path to glory. It's very, yep. very good. I think it's one of the most themey. Everything works together to push forth that theme of this is Zinch. This is yep. how it works. And this is how you would really love to play it in match play, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So, so if you want to be, the change you want to see in the realms, and this is the book for you. I think that having a Zinch player in yeah. Path to Glory is going to make for some fun times. Make sure that you control them so they don't have the runaway mechanic with yeah. uh, I summon every demon. Yeah. Uh, I don't have enough money to buy the kits for these, so I'm going to sub in. That's how many demons they're summoning. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, make sure you kind of rein that in. So Yeah, keep an eye on it, but yeah, it's awesome. I absolutely love it. Um, I, I think we're going to have some fun with this one. So maybe, I don't know, when we kind of tie together our narrative series, this might, this might figure in a little bit, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll could see. be. Could be. Um, All right, let's take a quick break, yeah. and then we'll come back with, uh, we'll come back with some balance ideas and the uh, MetaWatch articles. Sounds good. Make sure you join us tonight for the news at 11. You heard the lady, ladies and germs. It's time for the news at 11. And if you were desperately waiting for Warhammer Kill Team Shadow Vaults, wait no more. <laughs> Saturday, yesterday, if you're hearing this appropriately, yeah, you could have bought that. But you probably didn't. So now you can't because it's out of stock. Yeah. 
So you lose. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong, sir. Wrong. Good day, sir. <laughs> right. They told you about it yesterday, and they're giving you a week until you can buy it. That's so, right. So, you know, it's the expansion of Into the Dark. You're going f- further into the Gallo Dark. More of the uh, internal terrain stuff. Um, fantastic. Uh, that's the Kazarkins and the uh, Necrons. So looking pretty spicy right out the gate. Yeah. So uh, if you, uh, you know, went from uh, six to midnight after seeing that Shadow Vaults release with the Kazakins, you're going to be able to get them real quick. Oh, yeah. New Kill Team dice sets. It's actually an uh, interesting blend of colors, orange and gray swirl. Mm, I'm uh, not sure I love those. I mean, it's better than the just bleak orange that they yeah. usually are. Yeah, that's true. They uh, are better than that. But. <laughs> I mean, and all things we're considering here. And, uh, well, interesting enough, uh, Kill Team playing cards? Yes, uh, it features 51 cards because it's GW and they are ratted out the 52nd card. Yeah, yeah right. There is no one eye Jack. <laughs> 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 he was considered OP. In yeah, most yeah, games. after much complaining by the community, <laughs> the one eye Jack has been removed. <laughs> uh yeah okay i i like a kill team i mean i bought the last set of playing cards they had so yeah Yeah. it's all right and then near and dear to my heart the adeptus titanicus matched play guide is gonna come out uh six deployment maps five brand new host of new primary and secondary objectives for titan legios and knight households and match play games and then advice for running tournaments rules for doubles and narrative events Rules references for weapons, Titan trade. I basically it looks like to me a compilation, yeah, book of all the things that have come out, which is awesome. We needed that for some time, but then if you're big into uh, if you're big into Titans, the uh, Graviton Ruinator arm weapon, and then the Graviton Destructor head mounted weapon is out there. Oh my god, they are gorgeous looking. Yeah, the Warhound Titan Destructor. So your arm-mounted destructor is coming out. These are, of course, for Adeptus Titanicus, not yeah. for the Forge World models. This yeah. is for the one that you can actually buy and play. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, and if you're a fan of Middle Earth, uh, this is a big week uh, because, week. yeah, you're getting a ton of stuff. You're getting Boromir mounted, Blackroot Veil commanders, uh, one flag bearer, one horn blower. Elendil and Isildur are coming out. It looks like. You're getting Isildur in uh, mounted in foot and Elendil on foot. And then if you're uh, a fan of the dark side, you got the Haradrim King, who looks actually really bonkers good. Uh, the Mahout King, so the guy that you saw riding on the front of the elephant in the movie, is now riding a camel and on foot. And then he's got two riders that will flank him, as well as a warband that will go around him. They look super cool, and I don't know, is it me, or do you see a Chaos Warband there? I mean, just a little bit. Yeah. Like, just just a little bit. Yeah, I'm looking at, you know, for Warcry, that could be a Chaos Warband. Yeah. Just right out of the box, because they have a very distinctive look, and as long as you identify who's who, who's what, yeah, that could be very cool. I'm, uh, I'm here for War Camels, though. I am. Yeah. I am. These are my Chaos Knights. What? Yes. Yes. Deal with it. They came from the desert. <laughs> that would be awesome. I, I really like the the war camels. Plus, you know, also getting the uh, the war mammoth um, as a well it used to be a war mammoth in Forge World. I don't know if they yeah. use it anymore, but bringing that in as a chaos shrine or something like that, yeah. just a oh, big yeah. piece. Yep. I've so often cool. thought about building that Mumak as a chaos. Right. Here's what is my vote for best release out of this. I mean, I'm Shadow Vault's amazing. But we're getting new tools, updated tools from GW. Who would have thought? Super fine <laughs> detail cutters. As much as I like the uh, GW ones, they have the snippers there. Like, it's about dang time. Yeah. Um, get a new mold line remover. Uh, looks a little sleeker. Handle looks a little bit better. Yeah. More ergonomic, I should yep. say. Maybe that's why, you know, my forearms are jacked. Could be. Um, and then we're getting a hobby knife. Uh, pretty interesting, but again, er- ergonomic design looks pretty sleek. Well, and I like that because the, uh, the actual knife tightener, you know, where you, where you sink in the knife is actually mounted on the side yep. and it's a neural nut rather than at the end, which always comes loose. Yep. So I think this will be, that might be an improvement 
Although at the probably $40 price point that they're going to put on that knife. No. Right. No. Six replacement blades in there as well. So you get a total of seven blades. Not terrible. We'll see how, how much it is and how it pans out. Yeah. Got the new drill. This is interesting. I like the design. Yep. I'm hoping that it, it it's easier to manipulate than the one that's currently out. Um, but, uh, you know, it's definitely just increasing, you know, in ergonomics is really what they're looking at. Yeah, that's it. And it looks like it's two 1.0 millimeter bits and two 1.5 millimeter bits. So, you know, drilling out your gun barrels and all that. Yep. But yep. Looks clean. Um, White Dwarf 481 is also on the way. Look looks, at that cover. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. The WA surges south. Uh, <laughs> tell me that's not awesome. <laughs> that is AOS Iron Gel Love. Oh, so. yeah. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Black Library, War of the Fang, Chris Wright. Oh, God, that's beautiful that book. cover is out of this world. Oh, man. Oh, man, the in, internal, oh, the pages, too. God. So if you enjoyed War of the Fang, this special edition is, oh, wow. Yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, so War of the Fang, in case you don't know, it was that uh, it's that little incursion about a 1,000 years, so yep. what, 31 Um after the scouring, uh, Magnus the Red came to Fenris, and uh, he was a little uh, he was a little put out by what they did at Prospero, so he wanted to kind of do the same thing. Yeah, he's like, "Hey, how's that jean seat?" Oh, oh. too soon. Hashtag too soon, dude. So <laughs> yeah, she said spoiler alert. Yeah, <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> um, yeah, just beautiful. The front cover art. The uh, I'm sorry, the overleaf art looks just amazing, and oh. Signed by Chris Rate. So, uh, oh boy, the Void King is coming out. Uh, Rogue Trader Dynasties it's, looks like it's coming out in hardback and EPUBs. Looks good. Briar Dark similarly coming out the same way. And is this the sequel to the Hollow Heart one or whatever it was? I Briar Dark. Okay, Ancient Fortress and Shyish. Something Evil Stirs. Can a Beast heart. Hunter track down? I don't know. It doesn't seem like a sequel. I know it's a Warhammer horror novel, and it's by C.L. Warner, who really seems to have found his his niche, yeah, his stride there oh with the, the horror stuff. Curse City is so good. By the way, that just came out in paperback. If you yeah. ever read the Curse oh, City yeah. novel, woo, yeah. So that's that's I'm definitely getting that one for sure. Twice Dead King Ruin. It says, oh, the follow up Rain is Rain. coming out in paperback now. Yeah, um, since it's only available hardback before. You get French releases of Luther and uh, Day of Ascension, German releases of Armand's Eternus, and the, uh, what was that book? Semmelband? Semmelband. Uh, Horus Heresy, book nine. Yeah. Enjoyment? Oh, it would have Mark of Calf, Vulcan Lives, and the Unremembered Empire. Oh, nice. Yeah, so it would be a combination. Yeah, all those coming out. Have some Dark Angels, Lore Master, Zombie Flesh stuff on Warhammer Plus. Oh, very nice. There's a Hangout and Paint for Kill Team Shadow Vaults coming up. That's kind of cool. Oh, that's kind of cool, yeah. Friday at 5 p.m. on the old Warhammer TV Twitch. I will probably be on there. You'll notice that I'm there. As I have the longest handle on Twitch TV because I put Bill from Rolling Bad Podcast all spelt out because <laughs> everybody was like, uh, are you the guy from Rolling Bad? Yes. Are you the guy from Rolling Okay, fine. I'll just change it. Yeah. <laughs> And literally, my name takes up the first line of the text. Love it. So, yeah. So, that's what's coming out next week. So, really, a little bit of something for everybody. Um, jury's out on the tools. It will depend on the price point. If they stick with their GW inflated prices, those probably won't be a hit. Probably not. Um, I know the problem with the cutters that they have right now, the sprue cutters, they're awesome when they're new. There's nothing better. Yeah. And then as they wear in a little bit and that bearing just gets a little bit, then they the jaws don't line up anymore and they're only good for terrain yep. after that. Sounds about right. So, but I mean, the knife and the drill and everything else look like they could be because of that new design, um, they could be a lot more handy now. But as long as they're not coming in at, you know, the $35, $40 price point. Jesus, right? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes they get so proud of their name. So, all right, that's it for News at 11. All right, so continuing on with the second part of the lore show, we're going to cover kind of what they have. I'm going to preface this by saying I truly believe that this Meta Watch was 
planned, but I don't think they meant to execute it right now. But because of the leagues of OTAN stuff, <laughs> I believe they felt it was necessary to, to get this out there. And they did the Sigmar one first, and then yeah. they did the 40K one. Yep. And judging by the reaction from the Sigmar one, which is actually really super positive, and I'm super positive about it, I think they were doing that as a little bit of damage control for the Votan thing. <laughs> um, we'll talk about damage control in After Dark. But really, what they do in, in the in the metal, yeah, that, that will dominate After Dark. Uh, in the... In the MetaWatch article and the video, they talk about how they look at what what Vince has coined as the fat middle, yeah, which is where you want every army to be across many, many, many games played. Yep. And that is you want them to have a win rate as close to 50% as possible. Yep. When you look at your 5% margin of error, you're looking at 45 to 55%. Yep. That, that 10% band is where you want every army. And so... Now, a couple of years ago, they hired this guy, Chris Rose, to come in and be this number guy, yep. this generator. And we're starting to see, really, the effect of what this guy's doing. And he's actually giving them quantitative and qualitative information to say, hey, this needs to be worked on, rather than just going, oh, you know what? The community hates Screamers of Zinch. Let's nerf them. Yeah. Which, I mean, it kind of did used to be <laughs> it kind of, to me honestly if you listen to the aspects tactics thing about this <laughs> he does talk about how it used to be really you swear to god they took a dartboard threw it and whatever it landed on was the unit that got nerfed yep. didn't matter what it was yep so this is much much better in that they're using a sliding scale of games so they use the most current x number of games from the last like 60 days. Yeah. So the information is recent as well as applicable as opposed to, you know, we could look, we could go in as far back as we wanted to and say, well, Zinch still needs more nerfs because in 1.0, they won a lot of games. Yeah. That would be bad. Yep. So they explained their methodology, yes. which that, that kind of transparency and how he broke it down and showed exactly how, you know, Figures don't lie, but liars can figure. Yep. And how statistics is really based on that idea that if you don't know what your question is going in, yep. you can literally use statistics to back up any point you want to make. Exactly. You just have to extrapolate exactly. them the way you want. The way he's doing it is the actual honest to God. And so you know this guy has a lot of experience with balancing major video game titles that are played like in esports arenas where yep. balance is significantly important because there's a lot of money riding on that. That's this guy's background. So um, I was just really impressed with the transparency that they showed. Yeah. As well as the methodology and how they, you know, they kind of use the analogy of rock, paper, scissors, which I thought yeah. was a little too simplistic, but. It does kind of capture, you know, for people that don't know how that statistical observation works. And, you know, if you're if you're not capable or, or thoughtful of doing binomial distributions of results, it's really hard to figure out where these things lie. Correct. And it's real easy to fall back on, well, the top five YouTube channels say this unit is bad. We should nerf it. When in reality, that's not the problem. The yeah. problem lies... And a specific plus one that exists mm -hmm. in this battle tome. And if we eliminate that, we balance the whole book. Yeah. So, and, you know, they put up a screenshot of where the where the armies are right now using their calculations and their numbers. And I got to tell you, it looks pretty darn accurate to me. And honestly, it's not really that bad. I don't know. There's a couple of outliers at the top and at the bottom. And we know this. Yep. And they do too. And he even said, you know, Gloom Spider are going to get some love coming up here. Uh, Cruel Boys are going to get some love coming up here. It's going to happen because they are far below the curve that we want them to have. So let me just real quick go through what they say to their goals were. So yes, we please. understand it like in just context. What are they trying to achieve here? So external balance, you know, referring to balance against other books. 
right? Um, what they do is they check the average win rate for each faction, again, as Bill said, between 45 to 55%. Um, if every faction had a 50% win rate, a 5% margin of error produces results in the range. But they also monitor external balance at various levels, which is battle tome, army type, and sub factions. So the example they use, use is Orc War Clans, Cruel Boys, and Grin and Blades. So yeah. they're keeping track of all that data. Intern, internal balance, um, they have a different internal usage target set per faction. In general, they want 60% of War Scrolls to be used in more than 5% of competitive lists, along with 50% of faction enhancements. So they want about 50% of the enhancements to be used. <laughs> um, that's a bad miss right there. Yes and no. I mean, like, that's usually the case, though. Like, if you have just a singular army like Disciples of Zinch, right? It's not like you have the three war, war clans. You look at it, and generally speaking, there's like three of them where you're like, those are trash. There's yep. one you're like, I'm probably going to take that one every time, but there are these other two that I might think about, right? Yep. So that's sort of where they're at. Um, but also being using 60% of War Scrolls makes sense, right? But this is, yeah. again, this is about the competitive balance that they're looking at. This has nothing to do with our narrative discussions, right? Um, though people tend to build their armies around competitive lists. Yeah. Um, it's just good to know what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then universal war scrolls, such as endless spells and universal enhance enhancements, they want to be used in less than 10% of armies. Right. They're tools, but they shouldn't be the focus of your army, right? It shouldn't be, how can I best get this purple sun before nerf? How can I best get this purple <laughs> sun to just obliterate someone's life? Yeah. Right? Well, I'm going to play this specific army to do it. You know, you shouldn't build around the universals. The universal should supplement your specific factions. Yes. So that that's would be the, the goal. Then they did their uh, standings in an external balance based on 4,552 games at 446 events between the 27th of July and the 25th of September this year. And uh, I'm pretty happy to see my Beast of Chaos are at 63%. But they're an outlier. Um, they they're are. one of the outliers. And, you know, it's it's that that very little change had such a huge impact. Yeah, that Hearthstone changed everything. It did. And if Woo. you can shut it down, you can beat them. Yeah. If you can't, you lose. Yeah. It's pretty spicy. Magikin are up there. Sons of Behemoth, Disciples of the Ancient Bone Splitters. And this is going to be pre-book for Disciples. So showing you where they're at. But, you know, you expect everything else is kind of where you expect to see it. Daughters of Cain, Legion of the First, Prance, 55% win rate. Seraphon, 54. Overlords, 52. At bottom end, you have OCRX at 43 Slaves to Darkness, 41. Gloom Spite, 40. Cruel Boys, 38. So those are the ones gets and Cruel Boys are really hurting right now. Slaves to Darkness is about to get a glow up. We know about that. And the Bone Reapers really need a new book, too. We need to bring them into the new edition. Yeah. Hardcore. But, I mean, the, the article helped quite a bit. Yep. But it just gets you playing third edition. It doesn't get you competitive. Yeah. And that's so. that's what they're looking at here, the balance of things. And it's going to just keep moving back and forth, trying to get into that that fat middle. Um, it is really interesting to see Beasts of Chaos topping the the win rates at sixty three percent, given that they were considered a trash tier army yeah. for a long time. And you know, we talked about it when we talked about that article. It's not those changes were so small, but taken in total, they made it so good. Yep. And okay, so maybe it's a little too good. So they'll dial it back, and I have a feeling they'll probably start with the Hearthstone. Um, <laughs> Don't say that, Bill. Well, you take it back right now. <laughs> <laughs> you just shut up, mister. <laughs> you know they listen to us and get all of their ideas from us, Bill. Yes. You can't be. Yes. Don't put that out in the universe. The experts that I am rec uh, the expert that I am recognized as. I can't even figure out combos in the books, but yeah, yeah, I'm I'm the bell. Yeah, winner. nerf the Hearthstone. Don't say that. Yeah, no, I don't. love my Hearthstone. I know. Um, I like the spirit of what this is. I like the data since they analyzed, you know, it's a pretty decent, you know, set of information yeah. for a short period of time. I still kind of boggles my mind that many events occurred. Yep. Recorded events occurred in that amount of time, but it's very helpful. It's yep. really interesting to see where the data actually lies. I mean, and when you look at the 40 K side of things, it's even tighter, yep. which is crazy. The only two forces that are below the decks are Adeptus Astartes and Adeptus Mechanicus, which are at a 39% win rate, which is really odd when you consider the poster child yeah. of 40K is hurting the most. And at the top, you have Tyranids and Harlequins that are breaking the boundaries. That's it. Yeah. Everybody else is in the fat middle. Yeah. And when you think about how 
much screaming there is that this is OP and this is OP and, and everything in 40K is OP. And if you do this, it's just OP. Yeah, no, not really. No. Nope. Nope. You know what? Um, these It's so balanced in that game. Now, obviously, they have a lot more data to work with in 40K, but they also have not that much left to work on yeah which goes back to my thing and i know i start every show with how you know unbalanced these games are and how this battle pack makes everything ruined uh yeah you know what i think we're probably in a better space now than we ever have been (laughs) and it's quite literally with very few exceptions glimpse bite any army can play against any army and have a shot at winning yeah and we you know when we we fall into this trap, I think, sometimes everybody, but media producer or me, yeah, media producers in general, we look at something and we say, oh, that looks a little too strong. Yeah. And then that information goes out in the community and the community gloms onto it. And all of a sudden, there's this fever pitch clamor that says, this is too strong. And all of a sudden, we don't see the changes that we think are going to come. And we're like, why didn't they change that? Well, because the real data, says no it's not what you think so <laughs> stay tuned for my after dark rantathon <laughs> yes we're gonna oh i am so gonna play devil's advocate in this it's gonna be fun after dark is gonna be a hoot to play devil's advocate with the attorney <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is gonna be fun so that's basically our take on the meta watch i i have to say right now i think aos and 40k are so crazy well balanced right now that honestly, when you hear people saying stuff like, no, that you can't play against, or that army sucks, unless you're talking Gloom Spite or perhaps uh, Space Marines, don't buy it. It's real, you know, it's one person's opinion. And opinions are like, you know, other things that are distributed amongst all humans and probably smelly. So. <clears throat> So with that, I think we should probably close the show, right? I think so. Next time, we're probably going to be looking at the Path to Glory for LRL and or Sons of Beamon. Right. Since both books are dropping next weekend, give us a chance to digest it while you're listening to yep. us talk we'll about this stuff today. And, yeah. You know, so. <laughs> so I call Sons. Um. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll do Luna. I, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be pretty fun looking at those. I'm really excited to see what they do with the Path to Glory there. Of course, no one's going to be covering that right now. We'll be the ones covering it when it comes down. That's right. So I'm uh, looking forward to really diving into the uh, the big fatties. I really want to do that army, but it was just kind of unpalatable for me that they were just like walking forward, standing and winning games when they first came down. Yeah, yeah. But, you. you know, now I'm used to just total and utter disappointment, which we'll cover in After Dark. <laughs> but for now, um, look forward to some more Path to Glory talk. And as you can tell, we're sprinkling in the narrative stuff we've talked about already throughout this yeah. so keep listening for those yep those easter eggs part two will be coming up here in about a month i guess so yeah looking forward to it well for those of you who are sticking around we'll see you after dark <laughs>